Nashville, dubbed Music City. It is a major hub for the country music industry, housing iconic venues like Grand Old Opry, the Country Music Hall of Fame, and the historic Ryman Auditorium. Today I'm taking you on a journey. Follow along as I dig into my four-day road trip to Nashville to see the Decemberists and explore a town with far more record stores than I could visit in that short amount of time. I'll be sharing details from the trip and the records that I picked up along the way, including two surprise grails. Nashville is about a nine hour drive from Dallas, so a full day's drive. We took off around 7 a.m. and pulled into town around 5.30, so we completed the trip with pretty minimal stops. Centennial Park. We kicked off the first full day in Nashville with a trip to Centennial Park. This place is huge. Centennial Park spans 132 acres and has a rich history and cultural significance. Originally established in 1897 to celebrate Tennessee's Centennial Exposition, the park features all sorts of gardens and a man-made lake. However, it's best known today for its full-scale replica of the Greek Parthenon. This was originally built for the exposition and later reconstructed in concrete. Inside, the first floor includes a display that talks about the history of the expedition. It originally included quite a few other replicas from spots around the world as well. My next favorite part inside the exhibition was on repatriated art. It talks about a few notable instances of repatriation, including the time in 2011 when the arts and crafts retailer known for its religious dealings, Hobby Lobby, illegally acquired ancient artifacts and essentially smuggled them into the United States, labeling them as ceramics and textile samples. Hobby Lobby was caught and required to give up over 40,000 artifacts and required to pay just $3 million as a punishment. An artist of South American heritage also had a stunning display and I really love their use of mixed media in sharing their culture and history. You can't go inside the Parthenon without heading upstairs to see the 42-foot statue of Athena. The second level is massive, and it's pretty much the only thing in there. By the time we got out of the Parthenon, it was closing in on 11 a.m., which means the first record store of the trip would be opening soon. The Groove. Tucked into an old house just off of the main road in East Nashville is a little spot called The Groove. It's a cool spot tightly packed with record shelves and covered in posters and art. Uh, we got here and I dug around the new arrivals bin, didn't really see anything that sparked my interest. I did, however, spend a bit of time looking through the sale bin, which isn't something I normally do, though I just picked up one grabbing Nick Cave's Kicking Against the Pricks. From 1986, this is an early release from Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, which he started in 1983 after his previous band, The Birthday Party, called it quits. It's essentially an album of cover songs, including Hey Joe, uh, The Velvet Underground's All Tomorrow's Parties, and Johnny Cash's The Singer, to name a few. And I don't have much Nick Cave in my collection, and a lot of his stuff has been on my want list for a while, so I was glad to pick it up. The other item I grabbed here is a 7-inch from the Canadian band The New Pornographers. This Canadian supergroup dominated my turntable last year due to the 20th anniversary of their 2003 album Electric Version and the release of the phenomenal new album Continue as a Guest released 2023. This seven inch is a bonus for those picking up the band's 2017 album, Whiteout Conditions, which I also snapped up last year. I like the groove. It's a cool spot, and when I go to Nashville again, I'll definitely be stopping by. After grabbing some hot chicken, it was off to Third Man Records. Founded by Jack White in 2001, Third Man Records was first headquartered in White's hometown of Detroit before relocating to Nashville in 2009. This spot has it all. You have a record store, which also includes a trove of Third Man novelties. It's got a recording studio, a warehouse, distribution center for the label, and it has a music venue. We took a tour and I drop in some B-roll, but they actually lock your phone in a nice little Faraday cage. Just kidding, it was an old seven inch case though. Jack White is known for not having a cell phone and 
He prefers you experience his music and his tours and the like without the encumbrance of the phone. So all B-roll footage is from the record store and novelty lounge. The tour gave me a whole new appreciation for Jack White, who you might recognize as a key member of the White Stripes, Rackin' Tours, and the Dead Weather. He's been a major force in the fringe vinyl revival thanks to a huge dedication to vinyl. He also has the first ever pressing of an Elvis album. Third Man Records produces and releases limited edition records and has even revived old recording techniques in the label's Blue Room, which is the live venue I mentioned. This includes a direct-to-acetate recording studio. This studio for the Blue Room is amazing. I mean, you've got this direct-to-acetate machine, which records all of the live at Third Man records straight to vinyl. Now that is super, super cool. During the tour, we learned that that machine is actually on loan to them for a fee of about $100,000 a year. They even have a video camera pointing at it. So in the case of any kind of mishaps during recording, they've got video footage for insurance purposes. Any artist that performs in the Blue Room, which is painted entirely blue, like the cover art of many of his releases, can be recorded direct onto vinyl live and in a single take. Of all the Live at Third Man Records releases, exactly zero have had to be re-recorded a second time. I love Jack White's use of color as well. Everything is bold, which usually I don't like those bold of colors. Well, you have the White Stripes, which feature black, white, and red. You have Rack and Tours, which is black and green. Many of the label's pressings, of course, are black and blue. And then the label color palette is black and yellow. He also nails it on the graphic design front. Everything is tasteful and well thought out. And as someone with a marketing and design background, I absolutely love that. I mentioned the first Elvis release on vinyl. That ran him $300,000 and is a cornerstone piece showing White is not just a collector, he's an archivist, a preservationist, an appreciator. He also has a massive collection of other antiques and music-related items and even taxidermy. On the tour, we saw quite a few antique taxidermy pieces. Now, this might turn some animal lovers off, but the way they explained it was actually quite beautiful. Again, these are all historic pieces that White has now preserved in his location, giving the animals a new life despite their demise. I'm not doing what they said on the tour justice, but even that gave me a new appreciation for Jack White. Let's look at what I picked up. First, I wanted something to commemorate the sound of Nashville a little bit. Something a little bit on the folkier side. And for that, I grabbed this seven inch featuring Tom Brousseau, an actor slash musician, John C. Riley. Now, Riley has appeared on a few Third Man singles, but I really appreciate the blend of Riley's voice with the melodic essence of Brousseau. The other single I grabbed was Michael Kiwanuka. Kiwanuka blends soul, folk, and rock with rich, soulful vocals. I've been a fan since about 2019 or so, maybe even 2018, but he's been around much longer. This single was actually recorded way back in 2014. Now, I didn't realize it at the time, but the B-side is actually a cover of my favorite Towns Van Zant song, Waiting Around to Die, and he does it great justice. Now it's time for the first grail. As I mentioned earlier, Third Man is known for some limited pressings, and for the direct to acetate live recordings. All Live at Third Man albums I have in my collection are the larger runs of black vinyl. Most of these also had a companion limited edition run on black and blue vinyl. Looking around the store, I saw a record high up on the shelf from an artist I know and love. Taking a closer look, I saw it had the limited edition sticker on it, so I had to pull it down. It's Father John Misty's live performance in the Blue Room. This vinyl is really cool, and you just can't find it online for any reasonable price. So it was kind of a steal at just $30 US. We stayed at The Drift, which seems to be a relatively new and underground chain. It gave off total hipster vibes. The first night, they had this instrumental synth jazz duo performing in the Sun Lounge, which is the night bar. <laughs> The 
the place usually played world music, mostly with hints of jazz, but I did hear occasional indie tracks. The lamps in here were insane, and they were everywhere. Total desert hipster vibes that really made me think of the Southwest, say, Santa Fe. The lounge areas were a bit wild. Lounge being the operative word, very comfortable. I quite enjoyed it, and my only complaint was the parking spots. Just way too narrow. I'm sure that'll be fixed in short orders. We weren't the only one who noted this. Oh, and the place had only really been open for about a month or two, so everything was super, super new. I'd definitely stay there again. On another day during the open pool hours, they even had a DJ spinning tracks. Ryman Auditorium and the Decemberists. Built in 1892 as the Union Gospel Tabernacle in Nashville, the Ryman Auditorium is a historic venue known as the Mother Church of Country Music. Over the decades, it's been home to some historic and legendary performances, and today it remains a revered concert hall, celebrated for its exceptional acoustics and rich heritage. Side note, I'd love to take a tour sometime in the future, and maybe next time I head to Nashville, I'll do just that. Anyway, I couldn't pass up a chance to see the Decemberists perform live at this historic venue. The Decemberists are an indie rock band from Portland, Oregon, known for their eclectic sound and literary lyrics. The band often weaves historical and theatrical narratives into their music. Led by frontman Colin Malloy, the band has gained quite a devoted following that spans generations. The band has a new album coming out in June 2024 called As It Ever Was, So It Will Be Again, which just makes me think of Arrested Development. And welcome to And As It Is Such, So Also As Such, Is It Unto You. Unto you as well, dear <laughs> Heavenly Fathers. They opened with a new track, All I Want Is You, which is a fantastic love song. Due to the weaving of history and theater into their music, you don't often get such a straightforward love song from the group, so it's nice to hear one. Early in the show, they played a slowed down version of The Bachelor and the Bride, which was an early favorite of mine from the band. It's off their 2003 album, Her Majesty. Another standout from the performance was the track that Cheryl Warden of My Brightest Diamond takes lead vocals on as a guest from 2009's The Hazards of Love. The song is called The Queen's Rebuke slash The Crossing, and while Warden wasn't present at the show, the vocalists they did have did it true justice. Then there's 16 Military Wives off the band's 2005 album Picaresque. For this one, they got full crowd participation going, where Malloy pitted one side of the audience against the other in a true sing-off duel to the death. That was fun. Usually, I am one to pick up and leave partway through the encore so I can beat traffic. But not this time. They saved my current favorite for last. It's called Joan in the Garden, and it's a whopping 19-plus minute opus with this experimental, like, post-rock breakdown in the middle. It felt, looked, and sounded like they were transporting us into the middle of the jungle on helicopters. I mean, it was absolutely mind-blowing. <laughs> checked out the band's new stuff, I implore you to sooner than later. This will certainly go down as one of my top albums of the year, 2024, and I've only heard four or five songs so far. The Decemberists are the reason I went to Nashville in the first place, and everything sounded absolutely amazing. The acoustics in the Ryman are legendary, and now, for me, I can attest that it's not just legend. I hadn't seen the Decemberists perform live since their 2005 Picaresque tour, and it was absolutely amazing. This blew that one away, 
And in fact, this show is probably the best live show I've been to in over a decade. Vinyl Tap. So we had planned to drive out to the caves just outside Nashville where there's this underground in-cave amphitheater and take a tour, but the weather reports were a bit iffy about rain and we didn't want to risk it. So we decided to stick around and explore East Nashville instead. The day started with a stroll around East Nash a bit before stopping at a store called The Shop of Things. Kind of a little tchotchke place and I found this cute little toy for waffles. Verdict is, he loves his plush little sardines. Next, it was off to Vinyl Tap for lunch, which was a bit of a bust. They don't actually serve food. Now, there was a food truck outside, but it was Smash Burger, which is more of a chain, and we didn't really, it didn't really have what we wanted. However, the store is super cool with a record store in front and a tap house in the back, and we spent quite a bit of time poking around here the selection was truly solid with lots of indie stuff that I like. I pulled a number of things out and I only really bought one of them because I'd already spent quite a bit on the trip and picked up a number of things on vinyl too. So the one I held on to though was this 12 inch single of Kevin Morby's Harlem River. It includes two dub remixes and Morby has long been a favorite of mine. So I try to pick up anything of his I don't already have. I love his music. It's always really great. Kind of like a folk pop, maybe a little bit of Americana leaning. Always indie, always great. One of my favorite artists. After that, we spent some time driving around East Nashville looking at houses, which is something I absolutely love doing as a real estate agent, but I have enjoyed doing for far, far longer. We also popped by a chocolatier called Olive and Sinclair. Tried way too many chocolates and I got some for my wife who was not on the trip. Hail Dark Aesthetics. There was a bit of time before dinner and lunch was a bit late, so we looked for some other places to explore. Online, I stumbled across this oddities place called Hail Dark Aesthetics, which has all sorts of odds and ends. Skulls, taxidermy, tarot cards, Ouija boards, dark antiques, and a heck of a lot more. And it was here I stumbled upon something I never thought I'd see. They had this large crate of records, so of course I had to take a look. I found 764 Heroes Get Here and Stay. The band takes their name from the number that you dial in Seattle to report HOV lane violators, which is just absolutely hysterical. And their music is the standard gritty Pacific Northwest indie rock from the 90s. They were active from the mid 90s to early 2000s, so that makes sense. And they're probably best known for having a split EP with Modest Mouse, whom they shared a label with at the time, Up Records. This is their sophomore album from 1998, and you simply do not see this anywhere. I dropped 50 bucks US on this, and that was a steal. You can't get it for less than 200 on Discogs after shipping. Total grail for me. But can I just say, Hail Dark Aesthetics. Such a, just a weird, cool, eclectic place. Dark for sure. All sorts of crazy oddities. A place you gotta visit if you're in Nashville for sure. The Broadway Strip in Nashville. That mostly rounds out the trip, though we did go downtown for dinner. Broadway was absolutely nuts. It doesn't help that it was a holiday weekend here. Really reminded me of the Vegas Strip, say about 15 years ago or so before it all got digitized. Crowds were everywhere, traffic was awful, and the noise was pretty much intolerable. Drunk people everywhere, which is not really my thing. We ended up peeling off Broadway and finding a nice little quiet pizza place and tap house that had much better prices than the generic pizza place we saw on the strip. The best part though was afterwards getting to walk over the pedestrian bridge. While we didn't quite catch the sunset, watching the ferry come in down the river was pretty dang amazing. I haven't done a video like this in a while. Well, ever really. I have other haul videos, yes, but this one is a bit more extensive. So if you've enjoyed this one, go ahead and hit that like button. Maybe I'll do this a little bit more often. The trip was great. I have not done a good road trip like this 
in many, many moons. You can check out some of my other haul videos which aren't nearly as good right here. As one commenter stated a while back, this dude is a damn nerd. I am Andy, this is the Fence Post Vinyl channel, and I'll see you in the next video.